Chapter 11, Video 3. We are going to conclude this chapter with a matched pairs hypothesis test for a mean difference, or a paired t-test for a mean difference. So we're going to revisit the same example that we did last chapter when we did this with a confidence interval. And it said, a running magazine wants to review two watches, watch A and watch B, that use GPS to calculate the distance someone runs. They notice that the watches vary on the distance someone traveled in a given run. The magazine took a random sample of 10 runners at a local 5K charity event and asked them to run the 5K route wearing both watches at the same time. So, for instance, we have one watch on the left wrist, one watch on the right wrist. So they should be traveling the same exact distance at the same time. At the end of the race, the participants recorded the distance each watch said they traveled. Here are the data in kilometers. Now, do the data provide convincing evidence that there is a mean difference between watch A and B's distances? Now, despite this looking like a two-sample problem, right, because it looks like we have one set of data for watch A, one set of data for watch B, these were really paired to the same person. So this was an example of a matched pairs design. Runner 1 got to use both watches at the same exact time. Now, this would be a two-sample problem if they had said, we're going to give, you know, the first watch A to runner one, and then we're going to give watch B to the second runner, a completely different runner. So, but we want to see kind of, are these matching up to be the same exact value on the same person? So in the end, we're not really interested in the individual results that we get for the two watches. We are more interested in the differences of those distances. So again, I'm not going to look at these numbers. I want to focus my attention on how much difference was there between the two watches for each of the 10 runners. So again, a paired problem, a matched pairs problem is still truly a one sample problem. We just have one sample of values that represent differences between our varying kind of treatments, if you will. So the hypotheses, we are going to look at a mean difference. And so you either have to write out this DIFF kind of as subscripts here, or if you still just did mu, then you would need to define that mu is equal to the mean difference. So I always like to write the DIFFs because that reminds me that I'm doing a matched pairs scenario here. So the mean difference is equal to zero. If they were exactly the same, then I would expect to see a zero difference between them. Versus alternatively, we don't know which watch is going to be better at keeping distances than the other. So we are going to make this a two-sided test. We're going to say not equal to zero. And like always, we need to define our parameter that mu sub diff is the mean difference in distances recorded by watches A and B. Now for our conditions, same three conditions apply. Is it random? Well, it said the magazine took a random sample of 10 runners, so that checks out. What about the independent or the 10% condition? Are there at least 100 runners at this 5K charity event? And I would go out on a limb and say, this is probably true. If it's some sort of charity event, I would usually expect there to be 100 people that are raising money for this good cause. Now, the normal condition, again, we've got the three situations that could be happening here. Is the population distribution normal? And if it is, then we get to write that the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the population distribution is normal. Or, if that doesn't work out, then if we have a big enough sample size, we could try to use a central limit theorem and state the sampling distribution is approximately normal because of the CLT with our large sample size. And again, keep in mind, you don't have to tell me about the 30 number. You just need to remember that in the back of your mind and just call it a large N or a large sample size. But if neither of those work out, then we needed to look at a box plot or box plots, depending if it was a one sample or a two sample problem. And, com and comedian. And remember that a match pairs problem is just a one sample problem, but we need to look at just the differences only. That's the only box plot we need to consider here. So 
only look at a box plot of those differences. And we need to be on the lookout for strong skewness or outliers. And if we don't see either one of those, then we get to state that the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the differences show no strong skewness or outliers. And we will need to provide a sketch of the box plot from our calculator. So what does that look like for our watch scenario here? Well, it doesn't state anywhere that the population distributions are approximately normal. So no good there. And we only have a random sample of 10 runners, so that's not big enough for the central limit theorem. So we need to go to option three. We need to look at a graph of our uh, differences. So I put in all of these differences into a list in my calculator. And I went to second y equals to get up to stat plot. I only made sure that one plot is turned on. And I really emphasize this because in the last video, we wanted to see two box plots. So you might still have plot one and plot two both turned on to look at box plots. So you might want to go back to plot two and turn it off and then make sure only plot one is turned on. Select the box plot that shows those outliers there on the end. Tell it what list that your data is in. Hit graph. And then there's a really good chance you need to hit zoom nine. Because when I first hit graph, that was what my box plot looked like. It looked like it had collapsed. So when I hit zoom nine, it stretched out that box plot to fit my screen nicely. And you can tell based on this box plot, there are definitely no outliers. And there's some skewness, but not a strong amount of skewness present. So in the end, I can state the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the differences show no strong skewness or outliers, and I draw a picture of it on my paper. Now, I don't need to draw the X and the Y axis like my calculator screen would show me. Just draw the best as you can what that box plot looks like. Now, for the calculations, if I want to use the formula, I would, number one, need to write out the full formula with the variables intact, and then I would need to plug in my values. And remember, this is still technically a one-sample problem, but we only want to look at those differences. So I need a sample mean and a sample standard deviation, which I don't have. So if I go do some one-variable stats on my list of differences, in this case list one, then I get what the sample mean and the sample standard deviation are that I would need to use there based on my sample size of 10. So then I plugged in what those numbers were. My hypothesized mean, remember, is my null hypothesis and that is zero. And then I plugged in my sample standard deviation and my sample size of 10. And I got a test statistic of 0.8865. Now, I take that positive 0.8865. I want to find other test statistics that are greater than or equal to. If that had been a negative test statistic, then I would have done less than or equal to. I start at my positive 0.8865, shoot up to infinity, and I'm back to basically another one sample problem. So the degrees of freedom are just the sample size minus one. I don't have to worry about that crazy, crazy two sample problem. Um, or the smaller sample size minus one, there's only one sample size. So when I get that p-value, I get about 0.1991, but then I got to remember, the alternate hypothesis was a two-sided test. So I need to double this p-value to be just under 40% overall. Now, if I want to use the calculator command instead, I got to name the procedure properly, so I can either call it a one sample t-test for a mean difference, or another way that we had stated this was we could technically call it a paired t-test for a mean difference. Now, I like writing it as a paired t-test for a mean difference because this is written differently. So I think of that difference that needs to be down there and how I don't necessarily have to say one sample, but it's a paired sample, right? It looks like two samples, but it is really paired together as a match pairs design. Now, we still get to use option number two, a t-test. And I have data and I have statistics. So I could decide which one to do. Selecting data would be much 
faster to do because you just tell it, use list one and have the frequency just be one. Uh, and then you can select your alternate hypothesis and do calculate and you're good to move on. If you want to type in the statistics, you would have to type in that the alternate is zero or that the claim is zero. You'd have to type in the sample mean and the sample standard deviation and your sample size along with which alternate hypothesis you want. When I do that, I get literally the same t-test statistic, but a very, very slightly different p-value. Now, you might go, why is that different? And it's just due to rounding more than anything. So our p-value of either 0.3992 or 3984, both of those are not less than our alpha value of 5%. So therefore, we do not have enough evidence. We would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we do not have enough evidence at the alpha equals 0.05 level to conclude there is a mean difference between watch A and watch B's distances. Now, what I want you all to do is jog your memory on the confidence interval that we came up with last chapter. And this was the confidence interval for the mean difference. And I want you to think about how this confidence interval backs up the conclusion that we just had with our significance test. Remember that we ended up failing to reject the null hypothesis. So if I had just given you this confidence interval, how could you use that confidence interval to make the same decision of failing to reject the null hypothesis? And we will discuss that the next day in class.